Hey, peace, peace, peace. Peace, everybody. Peace. All right, peace. This your girl, Tiffany, coming through here live in effect. Today's topic, I am going to be talking about the National Welfare Rights Organization. Now, it's, I intended to bring this topic along with the Poor People Campaign, right? Because the National Welfare Rights Organization, they uh, worked in conjunction with the Poor People Campaign, um, especially after when Dr. King was assassinated. So they was working alongside with them and whatnot. Um, this organization only been around from 1966 to 1975. OK, so they only lasted nine years. Um, so what I'm going to do is I want to get into some details and some information. But let's talk about why I chose this topic. Um, the one most important reason why I wanted to get on to this topic, because we have to remember, you know, a lot of us forget where we come from and how we had to struggle. And to this day, we are still struggling. Um, a lot of us, if you grew up with uh, your grandmothers and your mothers, you would notice that they were getting like government assistance every month and things like that. And that was because they was getting, you know, they was getting that. They was getting welfare. They was getting government. And I kind of hate when people tend to look down and make fun of folks who on these uh, welfare programs or government assistance. I mean, how else are they supposed to get by? And also, this is the question to those in the um, community that say that, well, we don't need to rely on government and we need to do for ourselves. Okay, so let's take a let, let's go back into the hands of time. How would those people would have done for themselves, right? If they did not have any type of wealth in the community. See, when you come from a community that has no wealth circulating, what are you supposed to do? How are you supposed to feed your family? You talking about people that has been disproportionately. Um, you, you're talking about people who has not um, come from generational wealth. And they were placed in an environment that was pretty much making them secluded from all the rest of the population due to social stigmas. Okay. So at that time they had to do whatever was necessary to survive. And then the job marketing was scarce during that time period. So you had black people that was, was employed, but they didn't get paid the same amount of money like their white counterparts did. And then you had so many black people that was unemployed that was on the verge of being homeless. And that was those who was living on the streets. So what else they was, how else they was going to survive? How, how else they was going to take care of their family? So they had no choice but to put the pressure on the government and get welfare assistance. So now, if we know about the welfare assistance, the whole New Deal uh, project started with FDR, uh, Franklin Roosevelt. Okay, that was part of his New Deal was to bring about the welfare, the um, the food stamp program, the social security, all of that, that was a part of the New Deal. And then, of course, you had public housing that came along. So one day I'll do a separate topic about public housing and ghettos and things like that. But anyways, all of that was a part of the New Deal. However, everybody didn't get qualified for welfare in the beginning. So for black people, they had to put up a major fight to get welfare and not just black people, but, you know, the, the uh, poor working class people in general. But those people that make up the majority of those that's in the poor working class are black folks. OK, and then you got the poor white folks. Then you got the other groups out there. So how else was they supposed to survive? How else was they supposed to gain income if you don't got no type of generational wealth, no type of money circulating into your community, no type of major businesses or corporation or anything like that? How how was you going to survive? How was you going to take care of your family? I mean, these women, we talking about in the 60s and the 70s, right? Most of the people who make up those that are head of household, are women. 
they made up the uh, majority of those that was head of household. And then you got to look at how the welfare system was, you know, especially those who was getting Section 8 and that was living in public housing. They couldn't have the men in the house. Because the whole thing was to take care of single mother and children. So if you had a man in the house, you was going to lose your benefits. So either that man had to have a job and work or otherwise, you was going to lose your benefits. And you was going to lose your place. Go back and watch that movie with uh, the late Diane Carroll. And James Earl, the name of the movie was Claudine. So it was a story about a woman who had multiple children and she was on welfare. Okay. And she lived in public housing. And the the guy that she met, uh, I think he was working for a sanitation department or something. He had some type of job. And he would come over. He would stay the night with her or whatnot. Then when the social worker came in there, she would be looking around the house, looking around the apartment to see if there was any men in the house. Right. And all the kids had to go hide the clothes and they had to hide the stuff that this guy had bought them and all of that. So she had to do all that in order to not lose her place. She had to make that sacrifice. It's ruthless. I mean, people got to look at this. You just you can't just be on welfare, just be on welfare. Right. The challenge is you got to make sure that you report your income every month. If there's any changes going on, you got to report that. And then they have a thing called Welfare to Work Act, which was started in 1996. That's when, like, if women that are currently on welfare, they have to be looking for employment. If they're not looking for employment, guess what? They will minimize the amount of money that you receive every month. And they can eventually cut you off. But this brought so much uh, uh, stigma towards black women by calling them welfare queens. I did a video previously about a lady who's referred to as a welfare queen. So uh, thanks to Richard Nixon, Richard Nixon was the one that gave the terminology welfare queen. So now anytime you see a black woman, <laughs> the black woman and she going down to the welfare office, she's automatically considered as a welfare queen. But what they don't know is a lot of the people that's getting all these uh public assistance are white folks but the white folks don't get that kind of criticism like we do you know what i'm saying again they got access to capital we don't have access to capital so it's easy to uh see mo uh, a bunch of black folks down at the office and they are uh, trying to receive uh benefits and all of that it's it's very easy to just criticize and antagonize because you won't see as many white people as you see many black folks down at the welfare office. But they receiving public assistance. That's the part they don't ever tell you about. But it's funny that black women were considered as welfare queens. But let me go ahead and get into this subject without further ado. Okay, so um. And I, I might play a video. I'm not sure. So if I don't play a video, I will tell you what YouTube channel that you guys need to look at that goes into the subject about the welfare rights and all of that great stuff. So let's see. Okay. So now... The National Welfare Rights Organization. All right, so I'm going to go into the origin of how it was founded and who was the founder and the purpose of it, okay? And I also have some reading materials for you guys available, so if you guys want to check it out. So the National Welfare Rights Organization was an, uh, was an American activist organization that fought for the welfare rights of people, especially women and children. The organization had four, four goals adequate income, dignity, justice, and democratic participation. The group was active from 1966 to 1975. It, at its peak in 1969, NWRO membership was estimated at 25,000 members, mostly African-American women. Thousands more joined in the NWRO. All right. So let's go into the rules. So in 1963, Johnny Tillman, 
founded ANC Aid to Needy Children, Mothers Anonymous, which was one of the first grassroots welfare mothers organization. This organization later became part of the National Welfare Rights Organization. In 1966, delegates from poor people's organization all over the country met in Syracuse, New York, and Chicago, Illinois, to discuss the need for unity among grassroots organizations for the poor in the United States. Around this time, Richard Cloward and Francis Fox Piven, both of the Columbia University School of Social Work, were circulating a draft of an article called The Weight of the Poor, a Strategy to End Poverty, that later appeared in the nation. The article discussed the idea that widespread distribution of information by welfare benefits eligibility could dramatically increase welfare roles, thus creating a bureaucratic and physical crisis. In turn, this would lead to the replacement of public assistance programs that currently existed with a guaranteed annual income for all people. Clower and Pevin were more concerned with reaching communities groups with this work then with academia and the article helped to serve a link between the two. All right. So George Willie, CORE and PRAC and the birth of a movement. So in May of 1966, George Willie, a nationally recognized chemist, the second African-American on the faculty of Syracuse University and former associate director of the Congress of Racial Equality, and two of his associates from CORE set of the Property Rights Action Center in a two-story row house in Washington, D.C. The PRAC was intended to become a permanent headquarters for coordinating efforts of present poor people's organization. The PRAC's first project was planning a series of demonstrations that were to be coordinated with a welfare recipient's march from Cleveland to Columbus, Ohio, that had already been planned. This march had been thought up by representatives of the United Farm Workers Organizing Committee, led by Cesar Chavez. The PRAC's effort led to poverty rights demonstration with thousands of participants in 16 major cities on June 30th, 1966. With an extensive newspaper coverage in New York City, Washington, Chicago, Los Angeles, Baltimore, and Boston. Although there was no formal tie between the participating groups, the NWRO refers to the June 30th demonstration as the birth of a movement. Broad coalition of groups sponsored each city's activities, including but not limited to welfare recipient organization. Over time, there was an increase in coordination and cooperation between these welfare recipient groups, and thus a wide welfare recipient organization was needed. All right, so it was needed to draw the attention to those who welfare benefits was cutting out and they needed some type of government assistance. Okay, so this is uh, one of the um, again, this one of the organization that was working with the poor people campaign. So one of the focus that Dr. King had was focusing on the welfare of the mothers and children. Okay, but let's continue. It says National Coordinating Committee formed in August of 1966. The representative of welfare recipient group from 24 cities met in Chicago, voting to form the National Coordinating Committee of Welfare Rights Group. The PRAC office was officially named the headquarters for a welfare rights movement at a December 1966 meeting of the NCC PRAC was authorized by the NCC in February of 1967 to come up with a membership card for all groups affiliated with the NCC. Uniform membership requirements and a common due structure for its affiliates were adopted by the NCC in April of 1967. Okay. Early stages in August of 1967. Delegates from 1967 local welfare rights organization met in Washington, D.C. and adopted a constitution and was drafted by the PRAC staff and had been adopted by the NCC, thus forming the National Welfare Rights Organization. Johnny Tillman became the first chair of the 
NWRO, the NCC made a place for itself within the NWRO as the main decisions making body in the national structure of the organization. However, despite a nat nationwide organization, local welfare rights group still remained nearly complete autonomy for their local action. Okay, so um, during the first during the first few months of the new movement, the NWRO narrowed it, its focus from attempting to create a movement that would encompass all poor people to concentrate on those individuals who receive public assistance. Welfare recipients were easily organizable, and they had the greatest measurable performance within the movement. Also, in the early stages of the movement, Willie, Willie rejected Clower and Piven's strategy of flooding welfare roles with new welfare recipients and instead favor a strategy of organizing current welfare recipients into pressure groups. Critics of the Clower and Piven strategy argued that it was easier to create a welfare crisis than to bring about its resolution activists. Activists who were mainly welfare recipients themselves with little political power would be left amidst this crisis with the ability to do nothing about it. This move was also easier organ organizingly or organizationally for the movement because it was strategic strategically more difficult to identify those who were eligible for welfare than those who already received who already received it. It was more it was also more difficult to motivate welfare eligible individuals to act than those who already received it. And it was easier to organize current recipients of welfare by offering them benefits such as supplementary welfare payments. Hey, Sister Julanda, how you doing? How you doing, sister? I hope all go well with you today. All right, so uh, the bottom line is when you have all these different groups coming together the that brings a powerhouse so what uh george willie who was the founder of the the uh national welfare worker i mean welfare rights organization his main purpose was to get the current recipients right to act on it and to get them more involved and to bring more pressure to the government and say, hey, we need to uh, bring about more adequate uh, resources to the people. All right. Um, so let's see what else we can uh, find on here. Now, the activities. So the NWRO's first major activity was lobbying against the work and sensitive provision of the Social Security of yes, yeah, Social Security Amendments of 1967. All right. The organization held demonstration that included a sit-in at the United States Senate Committee on Finance Hearing Room. The activity brought the NWRO. RO a lot of media attention, but did not impact the shape of legislation very heavily. Now, check this out. In 1968, just a few weeks before, hey, peace, uh, Brother Fizz, how you doing? Uh, 1968, just weeks before the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr., King acknowledged the NWRO, giving leaders of the movement and the issues at hand an important part in King's upcoming Without Him Poor People, poor people Campaign. This nod from King later helped to promote the NWRO's first meeting between its leadership and the United States Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare held in the summer of 1968. And then in December of 1968, the organization was granted a large government contract to help monitor the work and sensitive program. Funding from this and several other large grants from foundation helped to finance a major expansion expansion of the NWRO staff, including the additional, I mean, excuse me, the, including the addition of the field organizer. 
The NWRO won much access to government officials during the first Nixon administration due to membership roles growing larger and bigger present in the media. Leaders in the welfare rights movement were some of the first to be able to meet with Daniel P. Monaghan after he was appointed to the White House staff and leaders also started to meet regularly with Robert Finch, the secretary of the Department of Health, Education and Welfare. During the drafting of the family assistant plan, NWRO leaders were consulted by the Nissen administration and these leaders were also active in lobbying against the plan. <laughs> so when Nissen got in the office, so Nissen at that time, he was he was very uh, asinine. He was the most asinine president during that time period. And what I mean by asinine means that he was very difficult. He was very complicated. He gave he was giving black folks a lot of hard time. So he gave black people a lot of hard time. Um, and one of the things he wanted to do was get rid of the welfare program for these people. So because he had that radical mindset as a, a white Republican. <laughs> and so that what made them push harder. They said, okay, now we got this white man in the office. We got this Republican, this, and he's very racist. And we know that he's going to give us a lot of hard time and he's going to put a lot of pressure on us. So we got to put more pressure on him. We got to keep the organization going. We got to keep this movement going. or Otherwise, uh, eventually he's going di to dictate or how much we gonna get as far as our benefits is concerned and there's nothing else and then we won't have anything left for ourselves. So y'all have to, I mean, again, at that time period, yeah, it, it, it was a lot of pressure. So let me see, let me go down. It says, despite demonstration pointed towards the United States Congress and the Department of Health, Education, Welfare and traditional lobbying and negotiating efforts, welfare rights at Activities were not mainly centered at the national level. The movement has relied much on a simultaneous demonstration based on common ideas and themes from local affiliates across the United States. NWRO publications such as its newspaper, The Welfare Fighter, document a accounts of the accomplishment and activities that local affiliates participated in. Local groups fueled much of the activities such as the original June 30th ra rallies and birthdays in the streets demonstration each June 30 after that. Nationwide campaigns revolve around local groups demanding for resources such as supplemental welfare checks, to pay for back-to-school clothing for children of welfare recipients, as well as the demand for retail credit at major department stores for NWRO members. Okay. And it says, by August of 1969, an NWRO convention in Detroit estimate roughly 20,000 dues paying members of the organization, and thus roughly 75,000 family members total affected by the movement. Most of the members of the movement were poor, mostly black women. By 1971, NWRO included 540 separate welfare rights organizations. So in 1972, Johnny Tillman was appointed executive director of the NWO after George Willie's resignation. Willie had been trying to mobilize the working poor, whereas Till Tillman tried to align with the feminist movement. Tillman's 1972 essay, Welfare is a Woman's Issue, which was published in Miss, emphasized women's right to adequate income regardless of whether they work in a factory or at home raising children. The funding for the NWRO had gone down by the time Tillman became the executive director and the NWRO ended in bankruptcy in March of 1975. However, Tillman continued fighting for welfare rights at the state and local levels. So as you can see, um, uh, George Willie, who was the founder, he stepped down. So he said, I'm going to step down from my position because his main goal was to try to mobilize the working poor. But Johnny Tillman, was her main focus was focusing on the women's issue at hand, right, particularly black women, because by her being a black woman and by her being the one that was uh, one of the welfare recipients at that time, she wanted to put that focus to focus on women issues and black women. Um, now, where I stand with the feminist movement, 
I feel like this, the feminist movement have not really uh, been very productive for us as black women, particularly. Uh, it, it benefited more for the white women than it did for us. So I have to be very, 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 very honest. Okay. It did more for white women than it did for us. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So white women benefit more from being feminist than black women. I mean, black women would just use as the pawn. So if you know how to play the game of chess, the pawn is the first to go, is to move. The first piece to move. Everything else, then once the pawn start moving, then all the other pieces come through. Okay? So that's how it was. The black women were the ones that was the driving force, and white women were using them. So I don't think the feminist movement did much of a work for black women. Um, some black women thought it was be very beneficial to join the feminist organization. And then there were those that said that, no, they refused. Because they, st they started re reading in between the lines and they started realizing that, oh, this is not what we really thought it was going to be. So... But I think that the feminist movement needs to die out. I think that it does not need to exist <laughs> as of today. But anyways, so um, the organizational level, so they got the local level. So each local affiliate of the NWRO was fully autonomous. The group was allowed to decide on its own program, make its own decisions, organize itself, and raise money by itself while the NWRO remained a resource for them. The only power the NWRO had over an affiliate was the power in which to recognize them as an affiliate. The national constitution required that members of local affiliates include a major majority of welfare recipients and that all but 10% of the members be people of low income. Each local group had to be independent of any larger organization that could restrict its freedom of action. All right. And then the national level, members elected lay, excuse me, members elected lay leaders who had the power to dismiss the staff director. They were biennial conventions of delegates from all local groups in the country, which elected a national executive board. The NCC consisted of delegates from each state that contained a local welfare rights affiliate. It met four times a year to make the basic policy decision of the NWRO. The national staff was responsible to the National Executive Board, which was representative of the largest states within the movement because they contained the most delegates. All right. So that was the difference. So you had the local level and you had the national level. Uh and there's more references at the very bottom of the page if you guys want to check out more information. And then you got the further reading at the very bottom. Now, what I want to do is um, I want to show you guys some re reading materials so you guys can look it up for yourselves or if you guys want to check them out. So here's uh, one of the reading materials that I have right here. All right, so this is Welfare Warriors, the Welfare Rights Movement in the United States, okay? That's Johnny Tillman, the lady that I was uh, reading about. That's her, okay? So that was written by Pramila Nadasin, Welfare Warriors. So you guys need to uh, go ahead and check this book out. Um, if you get a chance to, um, I will try to post up the information on Facebook and you guys can uh, look it up for yourself. So, or other than that, you can, you can check it out on Amazon. You can also uh, probably check it out in Barnes and Nobles, check it out at different places. So yeah, that goes into the history about the uh, welfare warriors. Uh, let's look at, let's look at chapter one. Okay. Let's see. Let's scroll down.
Okay, so chapter one, the origins of welfare rights movement. It pretty pretty much summarized everything that I was saying about uh, the the source from Wikipedia. So let's see. Let's um. Okay, so let's go down here. So I'm gonna start down here. What says the web? Anyways, all right, so going down here where it says the welfare rights movement sought to organize poor African-American women to reform F AFDC, okay, and in the process, make the program more humane. They confronted a welfare system that gave the, them a meager monthly allowance, leaving them unsure yeah, leaving them unsure day to day whether they could pay rent or feed and clothe their children. That showed them little respect and that stigmatized them as lazy, licentious, and unfit mothers. Welfare rights protesters rally and march and picket and protest to pressure public officials to address the inadequacy in the welfare system. They demanded that welfare officials enforce regulation, guaranteeing them a basic standard of living and eradicate those violating their civil rights. They believe that welfare should be distributed in a non-discriminatory and dignified manner to everyone who needed it. These demands were the basis of the initial welfare rights protests. So, again, going back. The, the government basically felt like <laughs> because most of these uh, recipients were black women, they were lazy, they were unfit mothers, and they just was welfare queens. And that was not necessarily the case. I mean, there were those women who did not want to, you know, try to make an effort or to do something and take care of their family. I mean, you do have women like that, but to marginalize a group of women because of the few selective women, that wasn't fair. <laughs> you know, it wasn't right. So it, it made it difficult for them to receive um, the amount of benefits they were supposed to get every month because of the stigmatism. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So they were stigmatized by saying that, well, you're lazy and, and you just a welfare queen and all you want to do is collect some money. You don't want to do anything else. So it's so much a fight to put up with. And again, we have to, even though we don't like the uh, system, we don't like the fact that we have to get government assistance, but we have to, you know, pretty much appreciate those ancestors during that time period that did put up a fight for that because we wouldn't have it any other way. We would not be able to go out here and um, we wouldn't be able to provide for our families. I mean, we got to look at the pro there is pros and cons. So the pro to it is if you get government assistance, you have a better chance of uh, taking care of your family. You have a better chance of getting housing, etc. But then the con is, of course, you know, the government uh, regulates how much you're going to get every month. And then they send people coming to your house, looking around your house and seeing, make sure that you ain't doing some type of activity that you ain't that that is uh, against their guidelines or rules or whatever the case. So that, that's the con part of it. So they took what was given to them. So we got to look at it like this. It's like you got to uh, you gotta play the hand that you are dealt with. And once you play the hand that you are dealt with, then you play your cards right. Does that make sense? So they was playing the hands they were dealt with. So they said, okay, we ain't got no money in our neighborhood. So what the hell are we going to do here? We ain't got no choice but to go to this cracker. I'm just... I'm going to break it down in colloquial terms. We ain't got no choice but to go to this cracker and get some get some type of assistance from him. And hopefully he'll give us something.
You see what I'm saying? You you ain't got no you ain't got no choice. You gotta go bad the white man, <laughs> basically. So when you when you dealing with the government, you dealing with the white man. You gotta ask the white man, hey. I mean, I, I'm trying to. Can I? Is there any way I can get help? Is there any way I can get something? I don't have no money. I don't have any housing. I need something for my children. And then, you know, people can sit there and make the criticism and say, oh, well, you know, women shouldn't have that many kids, this, that, and other. Yeah, but guess what? Let's just say uh, if women, let's just say if there was a population control, let's just say that. Let's just say for the argument. Let's just say that women did not have as many children. That still would not decrease the racial wealth gap. It would not close the racial wealth gap. Yeah, just because they reduce the amount of children they have. It's not going to reduce, it's not going to close the racial wealth gap. And I hate when people try to say that, oh, because women have so many kids, they um, you know, they 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 make it hard on themselves, or or when you have so many children, that puts you in more poverty. No, it ain't you you see. Here's the thing: women are not in poverty because they got so many kids. You know what I'm saying? It's not because of, it's because of the system they live in. See, you blaming the woman, you following the woman for having multiple children, but you, you're following the woman for having multiple children. You follow her personally to have children, right? But you're not looking at the system that creates the problem. It's not fair. It's not fair to tell that woman that, oh, because you had too many children. That's why you constantly staying in poverty. No. That's not necessarily true. Do you know how many people that came from a large family that was able to make it out of poverty? So that's not even the case. You got to look at how the system was designed. So you can't blame the mother for having three or four kids or five kids. You got to blame the system. The system of capitalism has created it this way. So even if she did have two children, okay, she's still going to deal with property. Even if she had no kids, she still got a chance of dealing with property because of who she is, because she's black and she happens to be a woman. We are part of a marginalized group. I mean, it was designed to be this way. It was socially constructed. You know, I, I just can't, I, I can't understand it for the life of me. Hold on. All right. <clears throat> you will always have people who work the system. That's a fact. You, you're right. You will always have people that work the system. Oh, you have people that will finesse the system all the time. All the time. You do. Okay. But what I was saying, okay, back in that time period, um, I cannot think of the lady's name off the top of my head, but she was considered as a welfare queen. She was she happened to be a black woman, um, or biracial, right? And so because of the fact that she did something, then that became the majority of black women. That became black women as a whole. You know what I'm saying? As if white people don't finesse the system themselves. But I guess we shouldn't have a conversation about that, right? <laughs> I guess that's going to be a topic for another day. But anyways, you are absolutely correct, um, Is Golf. You're right. You're correct. You're going to always have people work the system. I, I totally agree with you on that. And says, you are right by saying it should not be stigmatized by selective few. Welfare is crucial to protecting those who need assistance in their time of need. You're right. Keyword, crucial. Keyword crucial, very crucial. Yes. Yes, it is very crucial. It's very crucial. So it's like, you know, when you get the welfare, don't think because you on welfare that you got it made easy like that. No. No, you're gonna get harassed. You're gonna get harassed. Trust me, I know people who've been on welfare and they would get harassed. They would get phone calls, they would get letters in the mail, they would have to go and see they so um was it the social worker, the case manager. They would have to go see the case manager every month or every three months or whatever, right? They gonna have somebody come pay a visit at the house. It ain't easy. <laughs> it ain't easy. You ain't got it made like that. It is not that easy. 
Because they're going to be all up in your business. If you getting government assistance, you best believe that they finna be in your business. They finna find out what you're doing. They finna uh, keep a track record. Best believe that. You don't need to ask the white man or any man, person, or whatever for shit. For shit. We need to provide to those in need in times where others have plenty. Okay, so when I say the white man, I'm speaking like figuratively, figuratively speaking of the government. Because, you know, I mean, if we're going to get technical, <laughs> let's be technical. We still live under the patriarchal white society. I mean, that, that's, that's very technical. So the government was pretty much ran by a bunch of white men <laughs> at the time period. They was the ones making all the rules at the time. But you're right, but I mean, we, we shouldn't have to ask the government for anything, but at the same time, you need government. I mean, you don't you don't like the government, but at the same time, you, you need it. You need the, the government for your resources. That's why people go out here and vote, because they need government for resources. If they don't go vote, then you're not going to get what you want, right? I mean, so the whole purpose of voting is making your voice heard and be able to uh, uh, state your concern, your issues, so that way you can get your resources, whatever resources that you need for your community. Because if you ain't got the wealth, because if you ain't, because if you ain't got the wealth, right? If you ain't got the wealth, if you ain't got the um. If you ain't got the capital, then you're going to have to do whatever is needed. You know what I'm saying? And with us, we don't have generational wealth. We ain't got money to distribute in our neighborhood. Yeah, you might have some billionaires and millionaires or whatnot. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you, you got millionaires and billionaires, but you think they finna give us money? Once they get it, once they get their little wealth or get their little income, they gonna take their money and go somewhere else. A lot of them ain't even finna put money back into their community. No. They trying to spend it on each other. They trying to spend it on the white man. So, so you pretty much stuck. And then and they only make up a small number of those who are wealthy. So you make up what less than 2%, 3% of, of people that are wealthy. I'm talking about as far as black people compared to white people, they make up a large number of those who are wealthy. But you only make up like two or three percent. So that two or three percent of black people that are wealthy and they are rich, that's those numbers are nothing compared to the large number of black folks who are in the working class or in poverty or just absolutely poor. So you got no choice. So at the end of the day, I mean, until you can be able to, to come up with uh the resources and be able to put your capital together, you got no choice but to rely on the government. You got no choice. I mean, it is what it is. <laughs> I mean, as as much as we hate the system, we need the system. We need it because we need basic resources. You know what I'm saying? So you ain't got no choice. Let's see. Okay, am I okay? I am losing you. You can absolutely blame a mother for how many children she has slash doesn't have but you can but you can call out a system that hinders her ability to provide a solid future for those children for kids okay but the question is okay maybe i, I can't see where you're coming from with that but what good is it going to do to blame her for having kids or for not having kids what good is that going to do that's not going to do any good. And as I was saying before, yes, you can have no children, but that still is not going to close the racial wealth gap. That's not going to stop you from being in poverty because you have no children. Or if you have kids, that's not going to stop you from being in poverty either. So at the end of the day, it's not, it's, it's a system blame. So we got to look at the system blame first before we look at the person blame. We got to look at the system blame blame first before we look at the person blame because you got to blame the system because the system has created this the system has this problem 
So write down what you said, but you can call out a system that handles her ability to provide a solid future for those kids. Yes, you got to call out the system. You got to call out the system first before you can call her out. Because as humans, I mean, we're going to procreate regardless. We're going to procreate. There's nothing you can do to stop somebody to procreate. If they going if they want to procreate, guess what? They're going to procreate. And it's up for the it's up to the government to provide the resources for those people. The government knows that people are going to uh, have children and they're going to need to provide for those children. So it's up to the government to make sure those people get the uh, adequate resources they need for their community and for their environment. At the end of the day, you can't stop somebody from procreating. People are going to have children. <laughs> people are going to, whether they poor or not, they're going to have kids. I know about way too many gallons of wick milk. Me too. <laughs> me too. I mean, yeah, me too. I, I know a lot about the wick, the whole wick thing, whatnot, but yeah. Let me see. Government is for governing your society from, let's see, from road cleaning to public transport and welfare system to humans right itself. exactly and i'm with you on that uh fizz you're right you you got to have a government you you know what i'm saying the government got to provide your resources they, i mean if you don't have government you don't have those things that you were mentioning like you won't have public transportation you won't have um uh public libraries you won't have fire departments police departments uh hospitals the welfare systems, you know what I'm saying, all of that, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you won't have those things. You won't have all those basic things. So, yes, you need government. And, yes, you have to put pressure on government. <laughs> I mean, and, and for us, we definitely need government. I mean, we don't like the government. We hate the system that we live in. But we have no choice but to rely on the government. <laughs> you have no choice. I mean, you have no choice. <laughs> you have no choice. It, it's like it's like a catch between two. What, what else you gonna do? I mean, but the question is: Is the government gonna make sure that you are provided? Is the government gonna give you what you want? Who knows? Who is the government gonna cater to first? Is the government gonna cater to the upper class, or is the government gonna cater to the lower class? I mean, because now you have to look at the class system here. Not only racism, but you also got to look at class system because class system is another serious issue. Okay, it's another common issue. So who's going to get the catering first? Because you're in competition with those who are rich, wealthy, and those in the middle class. So who's going to get the resources first? Who's going to get? It depends on the candidates. It depends on what they represent. It depends on the policies. See, and that's the part about it. And that's one of the reasons why people hate voting because they looking at, okay, these candidates and their policies, their political agendas. They say they're going to do something, but they don't follow through. They cater to another group of people. Or this group right here, or this person right here won't cater to this group of people. They won't cater to us. So, you know what I'm saying? It, it gets real complicated. It's, it's, a, uh, it's a gamble. Folks will certainly be procreating. Exactly. Folks going to be pro procreating. You can't do that to stop that. They going to do that. You know what I'm saying? That's. I mean, as humans, that's part of the reason why we're here. That's part of it. Part of it. I didn't say all of it. Part. Don't get me wrong. Part of it. Okay. I tried to check out that person's channel, but I didn't really see any videos. Um, I tried to check them out. I try to check out that channel. I have to go back and look at the channel again, but I try to check it out. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to try to see. What, is, what exactly does that person do? The the person that you talk about, Jack Thrice, what, what exactly does they do? What do he do, like, for a living? So what? Because I got to figure out, like, what is it that I'm checking out from the channel? Like, what exactly I'm checking out? So that way I'll know. Because I looked at the channel, but... I didn't I, I didn't see like a lot of videos on there, so I didn't know where exactly what I had to check out on there. Oh, 
Oh, oh, oh, oh, oh, okay, okay, oh, oh, thanks, okay, okay, mm, mm, hmm, I wonder why he was killed during his first game, what happened, hmm, Oh, dang, my bad. Yeah, I'm going to go back and uh, check it out again because I missed something there. Oh, I didn't know. Thanks. I wonder what, what, what was the reason, what was the cause of his death, like what happened? Hmm. I will have to go. Yeah, I'm going to have to go back and check it out. The opposing team, Minnesota, injured him during the game. Iowa State refused to play them again for over 50 years. Oh, 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 wow. Oh, wow. Wow, that's deep. Wow. Wow. That's real deep. That's deep. Dang. So this happened 50 years ago. Wow. Damn. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, he was the only African American to have a college football stadium name after him, and he only played less than one game. Oh wow! Damn. Hmm. You know what? I never knew about that history. I never heard anything about that history until now. Like I never heard them. Hmm. I never heard anything about his history. That's the funny thing about that's the funny part about it. I never heard them talk about him on ESPN or any other sport broadcasting network. I never heard them talk anything about Jack Thrice. Hmm. Okay, so yeah, okay. I, I would make sure I have to check that out. Yeah, I'm I'm gonna make sure I look into all that. But okay, so let me go ahead and Get on to the next material. Okay, so I will have to look up more information about this brother here. I'm gonna look up more information on him, and then I'm gonna share it with the uh, with my with my channel, with my followers, etc. I uh, thank you for putting that out there. Uh, wow. Hmm. Wow. That's that's very tragic. So, yeah, you guys uh, check that book out, and then I have another book for you guys to look at. And then I want to go into an article. Um, and with this article, it kind of ties into the subject in a sense. So I want to talk about the article. But um, let, me, uh, let me share another resource for you guys to look into on your own time. Uh, this one is called Storming Caesar's Palace. How Black Mothers Fought Their Own War on Poverty. Annalise Orlick, if that's how you say Orlick, okay, whatever. So, yes, you guys check this book out as well. That goes into the whole welfare um, rights uh, organization protesting, et cetera. So, so you guys can check that out for yourselves. So I'm just going to go ahead and leave it up here, okay? Um, oh, and also, here's the website. So, so this website here is NWRU. So, it's another branch of the NWRO, which is which stands for the uh, National Work National Welfare Right Union. So, they are like another branch of the NWRO. Um, Here's the website, nwru.org. The National Welfare Rights Union Fight Poverty, Not Poor. Not the poor. So, okay. So, again, on their website, it goes into the little history about the NWRO and et cetera. Okay. Um, okay. So, and then I want to show you guys a YouTube channel.
Okay, so this is the channel that I think you guys need to check out. Uh, this brother, his name is Hezekiah. He go by Hezekiah News and Films. So he got a lot of old material from back in, from we talking about from 1990s, 1980s, 1970s, the 60s, even go back as far as the 40s. So he uh, collect a lot of old materials and whatnot. And he loads the videos up on his YouTube channel. So you guys need to go ahead and check his channel out. So he got a lot of oops, he got a lot of uh great information on there. Goes into the history about uh the games, the wars, the uh the politics, uh social issues, all of this different stuff. Okay, peace uh is God. Peace. Thank you. Thank you for that information. So yeah, check out his channel. All right, so now I want to get into this article that I happen to see because um, and, and there are some questions that I have regarding to this uh, whole information here. Um, this is called. Let's see. This article called Black Women in Georgia to Receive $850 a Month in Guaranteeing Income to Fight Racial Wealth Gap. And uh, this came out on Monday, January 17, uh, 2022 by Noah A. McGee. And the question becomes... The, I have a lot of questions about this, so I'm just going to go ahead and read into it. It says, there has always been some kind of di disparity for black women in this country. We saw, we recently saw the U.S. employment rate drop for all workers except black women. Okay. It's well documented that violence against black women have has been uncovered by mainstream media forever. So it's no surprise that black women face a wealth gap in cities across the country. However, the Georgia Resilient and Opportunity Fund will focus strictly on helping black women rise. The fund will provide 650 black women across Georgia payments of $850 per month over the next two years, making it one of the biggest guaranteed income insensitive in the country. Some of the participants will receive payments monthly, while others will get a lump sum payment of according to ABC News. And then it goes on to say, along with this insensitive I mean, initiative, the city of Atlanta or the real Wakanda, quote unquote, will also run its basic income program that will help 300 residents who are in poverty. It will it will pay residents five hundred dollars for 12 months. Black residents in Atlanta are four times as likely to be living under the federal poverty line than their white neighbors, with 46 percent of black house i mean excuse me give yeah, 46 percent of black households earning below twenty five thousand dollars a year according to recent research by the old fourth war economic security task force some 38 percent of black women and 26 percent of black men in the city are living in poverty compared to eight percent of white women and five percent of white men in the same city the task force reports now that is true and i'm right here in the city we're working, we're tired, we're stressed, Lockhart said. With an extra $850 a month, people will be able to enjoy sunlight and will be able to spend more time with their babies. Hope Willensack, the executive director of Georgia Resilient Opportunity Fund, said the program is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of what is needed to address inequality. All right, so... All right, so let me let me just stop right there. Um, now there is a lot of question that needs to be going around. Um, so for one, 
first first I want to say that that it is a great idea to um uh, start up some type of funding or you know just it's a great idea to help those who are at disadvantage and particularly uh in the African American community so I, I I'm with that but then my thing is okay you got 850 dollars a month right so now the question becomes how many children is the woman qualified to have to receive $850 a month? And then what about those who don't have any children? Or is everybody, is it black women in general or is it a certain type of black women that can have or receive these uh, payments every month? So now, why the payments is going to not only be monthly, but also for only two years. So the how is it that it's going to close the racial wealth gap? If you're only giving people $850 a month for two years, how does that help the, to close the racial wealth gap in this country or in our community? How does it do that? And why only 650 people or 50 women Black women in particular is going to receive it. And I would say this, I mean, $850 is only enough for somebody who may not have any children. That will, or somebody who have maybe one or two kids. But when you got somebody who got like three or four kids and you talking about $850 a month, that's not going to be enough. It's not going to be enough for that woman because, uh, you know, daycare expenses cost money. Um, of course, uh, clothes is very pricey, food and rent and all of that. All those things that's inclusive, that's not going to be $850 is not really going to be enough. I mean, look at this. Some of our people got $1,500, right? We got the $1,500 um, stimulus payment, right? When we got the stimulus check. That fifteen hundred dollars didn't last very long for everybody. So eight hundred fifty dollars a month for two years. I, I don't know how that's gonna work out. And then we got those who who is not gonna be very wise with their money. They're gonna take that money and they're gonna just spend it on whatever they want to spend it on. But but yeah, I mean it, it's just a lot of question that uh, revolves around this. Um, this whole article. Let me go ahead and continue. So Michelle Lockhart is a community advocate and member of the old Fourth War Economic Security Task Force. The program is ran by the Georgia Resilient and Opportunity Fund and is called In Her Hands. The initiative was initially brought to the forefront by the Atlanta City Council and give directly a nonprofit cash assistance service. It was realized after the discussion and survey from people in black communities took a look at the causes of wealth disparity in the city, according to a ABC News, which is where it should start always. Too often programs that are meant to help black community are not brainstormed by people who are actually from the black community. Okay. The initiative will start with residents in the old Fourth Ward, a neighborhood in East Atlanta, where Martin Luther King Jr. was raised, according to the ABC News. But one of the things that may be cause for concern is that the program would not offer financial literacy courses or advice on how residents should use the money. Hmm. Hmm. And it says, more from ABC News, Wolin Sat says that in surveying and researching the community and its financial needs, people can be trusted to make the right choices using their resources, but don't have a lot of resources to start with. It's hard to budget from zero, uh, Wolin Sat said. In fact, we've seen oftentimes community members with some of the fewest resources are the most resilient and resourceful. She added, instead of viewing communities that may have experienced cash shortfall as a deficit, we actually know and believe that these communities were huge assets. Lockhart says she expects to see the effects of the income boost almost instantaneously. Uh, instantaneously is a big word. 
I mean, I, I don't see how that's going to be a booster. I mean, if you got a mother who had multiple children and she getting like she got like four or five kids and she only getting eight hundred fifty dollars a month. I don't see how that's going to bring about a, 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 a economic booster for her. I, I don't see I don't even see that being possible. I mean, I would say that certain people will benefit like if those who have maybe one or two kids or those who have no kids, they probably benefit more than the ones that got like four or five children or four or five more. But I mean, I, I, I think it's a great start. Um, it's a great thing that, you know, that the focus is primary on the black community and particularly black women. <laughs> I think it's great. Now, also, as far as financial literacy courses, that's a detriment. I mean, because we need financial literacy courses. OK, we need some type of advice and uh, resources because that way we'll be able to understand. Then right here where it says in the article that it's hard to budget from zero. In fact, we've seen oftentimes community members with some of the fewest resources are the most resilient and resourceful. So, because we know how our people get when they get some money, the first thing they want to do, they want to go out and ball and uh, do this and do that. Because by the fact that we don't come from wealth, we don't come from uh, generational um, resources, etc. The first thing we do when we get some money, we're going to take that money. And we're going to spend, we're going to ball, we're going we gonna to do whatever because we don't, we never been exposed to that kind of money before. We like a million, let give somebody a million dollars right now and see what they're going to do with that million. Now they're going to spend it because they never been exposed to that kind of resource. They never been exposed to a million dollars or let alone a hundred grand. They never been exposed to that. That's a lot of money to them. They like, oh, I got a hundred grand. Damn. I'm doing good. They're going to go out and spend it. So we got to bring uh, financial literacy to our community. We got to educate people on finances and how to uh, properly budget. I mean, of course, you can't tell people how to spend their money, but you got to show them how to go about, you know, dealing with the process of spending money. I mean, you got to go through the process. You got to give them that opportunity to be able to learn. Because a lot of us ain't been taught financial literacy. We don't know anything about that. If you ask the average black person, do they know anything about financial literacy? They don't know. They have no clue. So we don't know. All we know is uh, trying to survive. We got to get our hustle on. We got to uh, take care of our, uh, our business, this, day and other. All we know is how to get our hustle on and how to spend money. And many of us don't know about financial res uh, 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 financial savings and um, uh, money management. We don't really know about money management like that. You would have to, we would have to take courses on that. We would have to learn. We can't, because <laughs> if you put $100,000 in a black person's pocket, I guarantee you, nine times out of 10, they're going to spend that money. Nine times out of ten. Now there are those who gonna save their money and make it last them, but the the ones that get a hundred grand, they gonna spend that money. They gonna go spend that money. They gonna buy whatever. They gonna shop wherever. They gonna do all of that. <laughs> I mean, that's just what they're gonna do. But um, so in all conclusion, in all conclusion. Going back to what I was saying in the very beginning of the video. We cannot sit here and make fun of people because they own government assistance. Because that's the majority of our people. They rely on government assistance. A lot of the people that live in these neighborhoods, they don't own the houses they live in. They either rent those houses or they on session eight. They're on session eight. Very few own their homes. Very few. 
but either people on session A or they're renting. And that's how people get by. You know what I'm saying? There's plenty of folks that grew up in the projects. There's plenty of folks that grew up on welfare. There's plenty of folks grew up on food stamps because that's all they had access to. Okay? As far as getting income, as far as getting a, a, a home, a, a place to stay, affordable housing, at that. That's all they had access to. And many people, yeah, they, yes, and there are people who finesse the system, but they do it because they're trying to survive until they can find a better outlet. They're trying to survive. They're trying to say, you know what, I'm going to take advantage of this opportunity. I'm going to do whatever I can to hold on to this house, you know, to keep this food stamp because they're trying to survive. Now, some of them would just go around selling their food stamp, and to this day, I still don't understand why would you sell your food stamp, but that's what some do. They do it because it's a hustle, but I, I, it, it just doesn't make any sense to me because you know you're going to need your food stamp why sell it, but anyways, but that's what people do. People sell their food stamps, and that's been a hustle for a long time, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But, yeah, people try to hold on to the resources they have until something better become available to them. So they're going to try to do whatever, they, do whatever it takes, even if that means to finesse the system. If they if they got to do that, then they're going to they gonna do it. They're going to finesse the system. Because they got to survive. They got to make sure that they still have a roof over their head and over their kids' head. And come from where we come from, we ain't got all those resources. We ain't got all those uh, wealth. We ain't got no money like that. If we had money circulating in our community, then we wouldn't have to um, worry about uh, that. There would be less Session 8 housing. There would be less projects to live in. But we don't come from that. We were put in this predicament. Okay. We was placed in this predicament, so we trying to do what we wherever we can to stay in it until something becomes better. It's all about survival. So if we learn about survival of the fittest, that's what it is. We're going to do whatever we can to survive. Mm -hmm. But then there's some people that do it to themselves. There are some people that... Get on the um get on session eight and not pay their rent. So if your session eight, let's say your rent is like forty dollars, right? And you refuse to pay that forty dollar rent, then that, that that would just be dumb on your part. I mean, if you have a job and you you know what I'm saying, you should be able to pay forty dollars, you know. But so there are those who can be and there, there are those who are and can be very irresponsible. I will admit that there are people who are very irresponsible and they don't take care of their business like they should. But there are those who try to survive until they can be able to uh, gravitate to other resources. And that's just it. Nothing more, nothing less. All right, so... That's all I have to say for tonight. Um, thank you guys for tuning in. Thanks to the chat. Thanks to everybody that's been commenting. Thank you guys for watching my video. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Make sure you uh, hit the notification bell. Make sure you share the channel. And, yeah, make sure you share the channel and all that great stuff. So, um, whenever I come on, you guys will know when I'm coming in and, um, if you guys want to chop it up, you want to join in the conversation, just let me know. And I'll post the uh, invite link on there so you guys can come in and join the conversation with me, etc. But again, thank you guys so much for your support. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank y'all for coming through. So um, I will talk to you guys later and I'll connect with y'all later. Be safe. And we still in this pandemic. So 
Y'all better make sure y'all mask up or do whatever y'all need to do. But be careful out here, okay? Because the pandemic ain't going away anytime soon. So, 